I'm just going to dive right in, in because there is a lot that we can talk about with ethical AI, and I consider it um, a cornerstone in, in safe AI, although I am highly biased as well because this is what I do. But I'm going to go over some of the, um, the main principles in ethical AI and go into some details on how you can integrate it into your work. All right, so the principles of ethical AI. I love this little infographic. It was created by Harvard. Um, and basically each one of these different spokes represent uh, a, an organization. So somebody like uh, Salesforce, for instance, but uh, government institutions. So like GDPR is in here, I believe. And there are cross industry, like IEEE has a set of standards and each one of these little circles is a category or principle. And what these boil down to, this is a little bit more nuanced than what I have here on the side, is around um, fairness, accountability, transparency, privacy, security, and human rights. And if the circle is lit, then basically the organization has included it. And one of the reasons I like to point this out is that, you know, there are differences in which principles are most important for a different organization. So when I was at Intel, they create um, computer chips. And so like their, their goals and their um, concerns are different than when I was at Facebook, which is like a social media platform, which has a ridiculous amount of data and lots of different issues than what I'm uh, working with now at Salesforce, which is um, a C to C, no, a B to B, a business to business type of company. So we sell our products to other businesses who then use it to um, make sure that their users are happy with what they're offering in terms of products or emails or um, nonprofit institutions use it too. And so what uh, we've done here at, at Salesforce and you know, like what you should think about in your research, in your labs, uh, when you go off and you know, maybe create a startup or join a company is what are the principles that are most important to your group and for what you're doing. So for us, um, this laid around a responsible, accountable, transparent, empowering, um, and inclusive. So the empowering one I think is a little bit more unique for, for our organization because you know, like we're wanting to be able to promote growth and employment for our customers and their users, et cetera. So you know, empowering our customers to use AI responsibly is, is something that's really, really important because a lot of times um, these customers are coming with their own data and they need to be able to say, hey, I, I know that you checked this model when it was in your house, when this AI model was in your shop, but now I've changed it. So is it still, <laughs> hi Panda, this is my cat. He does this, I've just learned to accept it. Okay, cool. So why are AI ethics important? Um, these are some headlines and basically every week there will be a new headline uh, about some sort of technology that's gone awry. Uh, and this could be things like patrol robots in Singapore. And actually this, I just saw a tweet about this with the recent lockdowns. You know, people are afraid of their privacy, of um, their safety, et cetera. And then there's other issues like with the AI itself, like with the labels that it might be putting on. So Facebook had an issue, Google had the same issue of uh, AI putting the primate label on a video or an image of a black person. It's like, yeah, no, <laughs> it's like, that's not okay. And you know, if, you're, if you know computer vision, you can say, oh, well, yeah, I understand why it made that mistake. Potentially like the lighting was weird. We didn't have enough samples, but at the end of the day, it's just not an okay thing to happen. Um, so it's important. You, we, we have to make our algorithms work for everybody um, in a way that's reliable and, doesn't you know like perpetuate the systematic biases that we've had in our society is what it boils down to. So, and one of the the biggest 
issues around this though is that you know like technology is dual use so we talked a little bit about you know like image labeling can have some very large ethical issues you know, and you might ask okay well maybe we should just not do image categorization or person read identification as a great example um it's super helpful to unlock your phone or devices i use it frequently uh, for that and it has also been used to id human traffic victims or people uh, that are actually criminally minded etc but and at the same time it can be used for person tracking it can lead to a lack of anonymity a denial of entry or service for different individuals etc so there, there's both of these coins so what do you do about this um you should ask you know is my project ethical and, and one way that uh, we go about that uh, at Salesforce on a regular basis and, and many others also do is to conduct like a consequence scanning brainstorm. Uh, this comes from .everyone.org and there's, there's varieties of uh, types like this, but basically what you're asking is what are all of the intended and unintended consequence, both positive and negative? And for those that are negative, how can I avoid this, this risk basically? So I'm going to point, I'm going to like walk you through a thought experiment. Let's say we have a, a factory where we're creating cars or something. And the, the manufacturing company is considering installing pose, estima pose estimation software in their plants. And they're doing this because they want to be able to detect if there's going to be a collision between the person and the associated machinery. So like, you know, these cars go forward, stuff can drop down. There's a lot of moving parts and pieces. And this could detect fatigue, uh, which, you know, together reduces the number of accidents by pre prompting, you know, an additional break. Maybe it tells the plant owner, hey, there's been a lot of like potential incidents or incidents in this area. Maybe we want to rejigger it. At the same time as, you know, like, Preventing these accidents, uh, if installed, all employees would be monitored for the duration of their shifts. And you know, the, the plan owners have decided, yeah, we should delete data after 72 hours, except for if an incident arose, but there still could be some issues here. So what uh, I've done here with, with a couple of others in my group is ask, you know, like what are some of the intended positive and negative consequences? So basically. On the positive side, we could have fewer accidents on the site, lower worker fatigue, you know, company has to pay lower workman's compensation overall. So here I'm looking at both the positive consequences to um, an individual, you know, like no one, well, very few people would actually want to get hurt on site. I probably can't say no one because <laughs> there might be somebody um, and the company also benefits. But, you know, some of the negatives is that now our employees are under constant surveillance and there is a cost to install and maintain the AI system. And then once I like go through some of the intended consequences, I want to think about some of these unintended ones. So these are, you know, like the secondary consequences that might occur if um, I didn't initially think about them. And some of the ways that you can come around to this is talking to a lot of people. That's, you know, 90% of my job, um, even though I'm a data scientist, is, is talking to people, trying to figure out, you know, like, what is this system actually doing? Talking to the stakeholders, trying to figure out, like, okay, what are you concerned about? What are you excited about with this system? And then, you know, having a discussion. So one of the positives is you could have higher worker diligence and productivity. Um, because the people know that they are being monitored um, or simply because they're excited about the system, et cetera. But a negative is that, you know, like the um, workers might not have any say in this. And so they could lose their job if they're not comfortable with the technology. If, you know, the company says thou shalt agree or leave, that could have some very negative repercussions on the workers. It could be easily misused by estimating worker productivity and salaries could be impacted. Um, this we have seen in uh, in shops, especially um, workshops, especially in China, um, 
or we have heard anecdotally. I don't know if we can prove it, quote unquote, but uh, also the system might not work as accurately for all. Um, video systems, in, so anything around the computer vision um, arena works best for those with lighter skin tones than those with darker skin tones in general. And also if you have, um, if you're, you know, disabled in any way, shape or form, then it might not work as well for you, especially with pose estimation software. And then another one you have to think about is hackers could access this video stream somehow, you know, it's, it is not out of the realm of possibilities. So you start to think about this and, and you, you go through and try to figure out um, how likely is it going to be to happen? How many users are going to be impacted? The frequency that it could happen? And basically these other types of like con risk um, forecasting to try to figure out, you know, like which one should I focus on most to rate them? And then looking from there to say, okay, well, what are some strategies that we could mitigate the negative consequence? So one of the biggest one is acquire work consent and input. Um, make sure that it doesn't recognize people. Uh, maybe it blurs out the faces of people. It alerts the station that a break should happen soon instead of an individual or something. Doesn't log any information on worker fatigue. Uh, different things like this you know, can help um, mitigate the risks. Uh, so yeah, that's basically like what you can do. Um, and this sort of addresses both like overall like ethics as well as it, it starts to talk about like human rights. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting exercise to go through and I, I highly encourage it. Okay. I am going to move on to bias, but I might pause for a minute to see if there are questions and I'll go. Yeah, and I actually have a quick question. Um, so this, this checklist procedure um, seems like a really great idea. And I was just wondering, like, is this something at Salesforce that, that is done widely, like on kind of any of the, the projects? And, and then is it facilitated by someone who has experience in it? Or is it something that like teams just kind of conduct on their own as a norm for? Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, it is done uh, regularly and it's done for a variety of projects, whether it is an AI project or just a new feature, um, which could be ML or rule-based or whatever. And we do train moderators to help um, guide teams. And I've, I have found it useful to sit in the room for a couple of them just to get the sense and feel of how, how these types of workshops are done. Um, but you know, the, the way that it's structured and you know, like dot everyone.org did a really lovely job of creating enough material to support somebody um, in, in this type of endeavor. The other thing I would definitely say with it is like, there can be a ton of imposter syndrome around this. Like if you're not a trained ethicist or whatever, then you might be saying, oh, I can't moderate one of these. But, you know, just by bringing up the questions and asking, you know, is this project okay to do and getting people's input um, makes you like an, an ethic, like an ML or an AI ethicist or whatever you want to say. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, yeah, anyone can do it, long story short. Yeah, uh, Gabe. Hello, a uh, question over here. Um, hello. Um, I guess I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but how about this? Like, it seems to me like a lot of the problem here is that if there is more information available for a decision-making system, um, we can't guarantee that it won't be misused. And it's kind of similar to like other things like, uh, so like you, you were saying, um, if you were monitoring people, like a hacker can see it, or if you're monitoring people, you can't prevent management in five years from doing something exploitative. Yeah. Kind of in the same way where like, I don't know, if, if people are carrying firearms, you can't prevent that from firearms from ending up in the wrong hands. Yeah. Is there room for having access to more information, but protecting it and guaranteeing that like good agents are using it? Or is that kind of like, is this the fundamental issue? 
in some way? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, I do think it is a fundamental issue. And there are things that you could do. Um, so you can make sure that when you are, you know, loading in the video before your data is even stored in any way, shape or form that you have like a face blurring or a face blocking type of algorithm so that you have um, protected some of the privacy. You could have very strong um, access control list type of scenarios so that you are ensuring that only those who absolutely need to get this data get it. Um, and then you could also get into the realm of like legality. So basically uh, signing, having like the lawyers of your company draft and then have you sign something saying like this data shall only be used for these types of things and basically making a contract with yourself that's legally binding. That's really strong um, and <laughs> makes companies nervous sometimes, but uh, you can do stuff like that too. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard because a lot of times when the data is out there, um, like I'm a data scientist and I love data and I love new data and I love glomming on data together because it's it's fun and interesting and tells me things that I didn't know beforehand um, and tells like whoever I'm helping out new things, but like the awareness part of it also has to be there. One thing I'll talk about later are model cards um, and data cards. And so those also go into like um, aspects of the intended use of data sets and models and unintended, et cetera. So that that type of communication is really helpful too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for your question. Hi, um, I was wondering at Salesforce in particular, as a B2B company, um, how much of this is like weighing your own products you're building versus considering your clients and who's actually going to be using um, your products and how, how is that different? Yeah, so um, I guess like there's two things in there. Like We have a lot of global models. And so basically those are models that we train on all of our data. Um, and so then we make certain that well, a lot of that comes around bias, you know, in all honesty, but we make sure that the, the usages and the examples that we give to our customers are, um, are ethical or as ethical as possible. And then we also provide them tools in the form of um, training modules. And I'll talk about our acceptable use policy, but well, maybe I'll talk about it now. But basically, like things that we say they may not do with our technology. So for instance, um, this, oh, oh yeah, sorry, passed. The, you know, face re-identification example that I give, that's something that our um, other businesses can't use with our software because we just found it to be too ethically issues, have too many issues basically. So, um, but yeah, we focus on both, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, totally. Thanks for your question. If I can ask uh, one more question. Yeah. Um, so I feel like often in, in these ethically ambiguous domains, one argument that, that some companies make is uh, if we don't build the product, you know, this more extreme way, another company is going to build the product, take over the market. Yeah. And so right now, or maybe also in 10 years from now, where do you see like, you know, maybe the law stepping in at some point and how much law do we require or how much can the company still kind of bring from their own side? No, for sure. That's a great question. And it's something that we've actually seen shift a little bit with um, GDPR, which came out, I don't know how many years ago, probably four-ish years ago by this point in Europe, which restricts um, companies that operate in the EU, I believe, how they handle data. Um, and so one of the things I think that <laughs> was uh, a side benefit for us, even though we don't live there, is a lot of a lot more explicit consent around data that websites collect, um, this idea of being the right to be forgotten, et cetera. But there are also minimal uh, types of requirement around transparency and bias testing. Those are getting more and more, um, there's more and more regulation that's coming down the pipe in those areas. Uh, but yeah, as sort of like a, 
a software provider, like, because we don't own the data, there are less things that Salesforce is legally compliant to act upon. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, so, <laughs> but I talk to a lot of lawyers all the time. Uh, and, but at the same time, we're like, yeah, we still need to be responsible. We still need to ensure that this is happening um, because at some point down the line, it's it's not going to just be like the data owners that have these requirements um, imposed upon them, but but other organizations like ourselves as well. So and we're in a weird little gray area where we do create some algorithms too. So um, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. But hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Alrighty. Um, so I'm going to go into bias now, and bias is really interesting and there is it's a term that's like overly used so i wanted to do some definitions here so basically you have some uh, algorithmic bias so your systematic errors in the model's prediction so you probably have seen more than one powerpoint presentation of um looking at like accuracy versus bias with uh either darts on a dartboard or like arrows in a in a, in a target but then you can also have things like societal bias. So this is preconceptions of a person or group of people that can lead to systematic advantages or disadvantages. Um, so this could be things around housing loans where uh, uh, black and um, uh, uh, Asian and other uh, minority groups have had disadvantages in certain regions or, or, or across like the US in particular, getting the same types of loans as the Caucasian individuals. Now, when you talk about fairness, it's basically your systematic bias for a specific subpopulation which mirrors or exacerbates so, social bias. So basically what can happen is if you create like a loan application AI and it's trained on your historically historical data, and that's biased, then your AI system could be as bad or even worse, we've seen in some cases, um, as, as your um, historical bias. And I talk about subpopulations here. It's, it's These are basically groups of protected class variables, which could be race, gender, age, uh, or other variables of concern, like socioeconomic class. Some of this comes from the partnership on AI and they're a great resource. So um, yeah. One of the really uh, in important aspects to note, though, is that not everyone has the same ethical principles. And our conversation in what is fair and what is unfair is ongoing, it's complex, it's messy, and it can be really heated. And then it gets even more complex when you're in practice. Uh, this is a uh, image from The Good Place, which is a glorious and hilarious show, by the way. But basically in here, um, Chidi Anagonye, who is an ethics professor, is put into a real life trolley problem. And the, the trolley problem has a lot of different variants, but basically it, it asks the questions like, you are a bystander on the road and a trolley is coming down the tracks. Now you can pull this lever and uh, switch the, the trolley from one track to the other. If you don't pull the lever, then one person, or no, five people will be killed um, because they're on the track and they can't get off. If you do pull the lever, then one person will be killed. So what, what do you do? It's, it's basically a question of objectives and like, uh, would you actually intervene, et cetera. And there's, there's a large number of variants, but you know, like in the real world, it's like you can answer this in a in a classroom, and you might get a different answer than if you are actually standing there on the street. And AI can be biased in like a lot of ways. Basically, it's you know, bias can be all the way down, um, sort of like turtles are all the way down, but who gets access to the benefits and service, um, what is the purpose of the AI, you know, like who's going to be impacted, 
your training data is a big one um, so that the representation of everyone impacted your historical bias and then uh, your model too if you include uh, subpopulation sensitive data in your model then it could exacerbate it in a way than if you um, leave it out so this diagram sort of goes into a little bit more data representation of, of our sources of bias. Um, and I, I went through them, but uh, this Shiresh and Butag paper is, is helpful. And if I haven't already given y'all a list of references, I'll make sure to do that so you have it. Um, but yeah, bias can get in everywhere. And what you wanna do is, is check. So, you know, check to see what are some historical biases that could be occurring when I'm designing the system. How am I selecting my data? If I'm just scraping off of Twitter or off of Facebook, then who are the users of those systems? And does that represent all the people that I'm wanting to talk to or is it not representative? Quick question. Um, yeah. So wondering if you guys actually bake any of the bias testing into whatever CICD pipelines y'all have? It is in some places, but that's that's also my job is to make it into more of the places. So we have a tool called Einstein Discovery, and that one has baked in um, a lot of really good tools for the end user. One of the really interesting things there is that it's basically like um, a logistic regression, fairly simple type of algorithm. Well, I shouldn't say simple. It there's a lot on the back end, but. It, it helps step a user through to make sure that they do have representative data. Um, and then it does some bias checks on the model that it then gives to the, to the like data owners. So a lot of times like at Salesforce, we don't actually see any of the data, but, but yeah, we've been systematically going through a lot of our other uh, models and trying to check for it too. So do you do like unit testing or is it just like um, like, is it just going down a checklist or do you actually run it through like test cases? Yeah. So some of it could be done in unit tests. Um, a lot of the questions that actually of concern that actually crop up more than the final, like, is this model biased or not come earlier. So like doing the consequence scanning workshops, looking at, uh, who is applying the labels, how is the data acquired, those can't really be unit tested. So um, instead we use like sort of more of a checklist form. Right, but you could test um, model behavior on simulated yes. data. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no, and, that, and that's a great idea to do. And um, there's a lot of really good tools. Uh, is that my next slide? It might be my next slide. Uh, no, it's not. I'm just gonna skip that slide for now and I'll come back to it, but uh, so some of the open source tools that are out there are really helpful for exactly what you were uh, describing. Like uh, IBM Watson has a Fairness 360 and Explainability 360 toolkit uh, that can help you look to see, you know, like are are these models fair based on these various subpopulations? But there are many more too. So Google has quite a few, and then these are just a smattering of other GitHub repositories. One of the tricky things though, too, that you have to do with them, um, I'll go back to this one, is that there's like a ridiculous number of definitions of fairness. And the reason for that is different situations um, are harmful in different ways to an end user. So you might, if you're doing the sort of like a hiring or admissions type of model, statistical parity might be the definition of fairness that's best because you know, it's basically saying that there should be equal prediction rates between certain categories, but that might not always be true for other types of models. Um, so you sort of have to think of, think and figure out like what is the definition of fairness and therefore like the, um, the end metric that you are checking for in your unit test. Cool. And there is a ton of research 
in this area and it spans all types of data. So there's a lot in NLP, computer vision, as well as categorical types of data. And there's a, a good number of data sets out there now, which is helpful. So some of these are pseudo benchmark types of data sets. Um, and some of them are built to test specific scenarios. And we have an ongoing list, thanks to my, my manager, Kathy Baxter, keeps this blog up to date. Cool. So if you're looking for research things, it's a good one. OK, I'm going to press onward because uh, I don't want to run out of time. But the, the next topic that I want to chat about is around accountability. And basically, once you're ready to deploy, you want to ask, you know, who is ultimately responsible for how a system is used and the decision it makes? And if there's a mistake that's made, how can it get corrected? Uh, how can a user appeal decisions that were made by the AI system? And this um, appeal decision, that's another uh, regulation that is, has been enacted in the GDPR. There's a little bit less uh, CS and DS research in this area, but uh, it's, it should be baked into every type of project that you do. Um, and to sort of highlight this, I'm gonna go through a case study. So sharks, you know, uh, basically they're changing where they swim and breed because of climate change. And so what we wanted to do is um, there's a Benioff Ocean Institute. Uh, it's founded and run or something by our CEO, Mark Benioff. And they came to us with the question is like, how can we study sharks and protect them while also helping humans and sharks safely share the ocean. Basically, we want less shark human incidences on beaches. So uh, MJ here started this idea of shark eye. So basically use AI to detect great white sharks to learn about their biology and help people share the ocean with marine wildlife. And how accountability comes into place here is you know, figuring out where a human should be in this process. So a dispatcher can define territories and the skills that are required to collect data, um, oversee that type of work, yeah. et cetera. And, you know, there's data collectors. So uh, professional drone pilots who are assigned territories and scheduled to routinely survey areas of beaches <laughs> Sounds like sort of a lovely job <laughs> to have. Um, and then, you know, like, how do we even make sure that, you know, like the final UI that the drone dispatcher or the um, expert at the end of the day is able to look at this video and say, okay, like, do I trust it or not? Because AI is going to make mistakes. You know, AI is not infallible. So by showing, you know, like the bounding box, the prediction, and um, a percentage, you're able to really quickly convey a lot of information because sometimes it'll capture kelp as a shark. And that's not correct, but you know, it sort of looks like a shark in some instances. The other thing it's not doing is making any predictions about the person on the paddleboard. So it's not, this model wasn't trained on people, just on sharks. So again, trying to like preserve privacy. Then the last um, group of people that are included are safety workers. Um, and these are dispatched when positive sightings of sharks are made to ensure people are safe. You know, saying, hey, the beach, swim beach is closed. There's a shark in the area, et cetera. Okay, so some of the questions we asked um, is like, how can this be used with either malice or <laughs> alarming stupidity? And I like the phrasing of that because yeah, you know, it could be done on purpose, but it could also be done on terrible accident. Who could be harmed? So this is both like the people on the beach, the sharks themselves, um, other wildlife, like the seagulls. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that goes on on the beach. Do we have enough perspective to understand the risks? And if not, who can we bring in to supplement it? So this is where we brought in the Benioff Ocean Institute. We aren't shark experts. We're like data scientists. It's like, yeah, if you give me enough data of like oceans 
and beaches with sharks, I can totally build you a classifier that can predict them. Um, and it'll be fun and it'll be glorious. But I want to make sure that I have enough information. Like what else could be in the water? How can we ensure privacy? And yeah, what if there's drones everywhere? So some of the considerations that we made to like mitigate this, this is basically going through that consequence scanning workshop again is, you know, we're going to begin our recordings over the water only because that's the area of interest and the AI isn't trained on people. We have certified drone net operators employed by the Maniav Ocean Institute. So they're the ones that say, okay, yeah, these people can fly on a beach. And, you know, there are high risk beaches are scheduled and making sure that there isn't like too many people on the beach flying drones at the same time. Cool. Another part, way to um, have accountability is um, making sure that you are transparent and that you have enough explainability. And one of the biggest things I've learned in this area is that just because I understand what's going on doesn't mean that everyone else will. And there's like differing levels of specificity, technical details um, that are necessary in your documentation. So you might need to have something very broad for our interested public versus like your users, uh, external collaborators or auditors, and the most information to your internal team members. Like if I submit a PR request um, or if I submit a feature request, I want to provide as much information as I can. So this is where uh, model com cards come in. And this is with uh, accountability, where accountability also comes into play. And the reason I really like model cards is that they're a very high level overview of when a model was trained, why it was trained, how it was trained, um, some of its ethical considerations, where it should be used, where it shouldn't be used. So in, you know, like the great white shark, the shark eye example, I would want to say this is trained on great white sharks, or this is trained on tiger sharks and hammerhead sharks. And so then if um, a researcher from another institute is using my model and they have uh, more sharks, whale sharks, then they would know that they were able or weren't able to use my model um, and would retrain it. Or if they saw that the model date was from like five years ago, and they knew that the technology, the cameras on their systems were much better, they would also change it. Cool. Any questions on accountability and model cards? Because I'm switching just a tiny bit. Okay. Another, um, oh, whoops, I had one more for transparency. There is a lot of transparency research and I it's fascinating. So especially when you get into neural networks or these really complex uh, AI algorithms, you, you need to start to figure out, okay, well, what in the world is going on? And there are some uh, applications for feature importances like Lime and Shap, as well as attention layers. This uh, website from Distill is utilizing attention layers, I think it seems like, and basically it's highlighting where in an image it thinks there's a laboratory or a tiger cat. The other really interesting thing I feel like with transparency is that depending on how much transparency you need, it might sort of direct you to a different type of model. So for instance, cancer research, there are a lot of models that are starting to be able to identify tumors or other types of diseases in the body. And if you have a simple classifier that says, okay, in this image, I see cancer or I don't see cancer. Well, you know, like that's sort of useful. But if you instead had like um, a segmentation model where it's saying in this specific image of the picture, I see cancer or I see a problem, then that can really help uh, um, a, a doctor or a technician much more to be able to clue in and say, yeah, I agree with the AI or I don't think the AI is correct. So basically like helping AI be a force multiplier for you can 
can really change what type of model you want to deploy. And then uh, I know there are a number of students as well as um, other prof you know, professionals in here and AI ethics can be your career. So there are more and more startup companies uh, in both that are doing this. This is a smattering of a few of them. And there's also lots of large companies that have ethicists because, you know, we as we've seen AI be utilized in so many different ways, we have really realized that, you know, like we need to do it, deploy AI in a safe um, and ethical manner. And then if, you know, conferences and academia are your thing and, you know, then this is also really important because it's focused on, on at conferences more and more. So these are a few of them that have highlighted it, but um, NeurIPS and ICML in particular were a couple of the first to require impact statements. So basically, if you're submitting a paper, you need to now say, like, what are the ethical considerations of, of this work? And a lot of the things that I pointed out during this can be helpful. Okay, so last couple of minutes, I uh, wanna leave y'all with some helpful tools and resources. Uh, ethical AI is a huge realm. Um, so, you know, there are semester long courses that deal with this. And actually I was given a, a handful of these by Juan Carlos Niebles, who is also a professor at Stanford. But one of the tools that I always suggest is Dion. Dion is a basic checklist. It's created by uh, Driven Data. They're actually located in the Bay. And it's a checklist that's Jupyter Rep Notebook or Read Me Ready. So this can in increase your accountability and your transparency again. But it goes through a bunch of the questions that I raised and didn't raise and you know helps you ask, OK, if I am collecting data, did they give in informed consent? You know, is there? PII exposure, what is, what about our collection bias, et cetera, all through, all the way through deployment. And this is the entire checklist. So it can help you to start to ask the questions that are necessary. Other tools, I talked a little bit already about the 360 toolkit. Um, so I'm gonna skip that one. And uh, these are some of the Stanford class, classes that Juan Carlos pointed me out to. These are all, I guess, in CS, it looks like. Um, but especially things around ethics, public policy, and technological change, things like this will really delve deeper into the history of um, AI ethics, why it's important, what we are doing about it, et cetera. And there's, very, there's more specific ones around NLP. And I'm sure in the coming years, there will be even more. And you know, Salesforce also, of course, has some things too. The one that I mentioned a little bit earlier is this trailhead. So base, this is a series of courses that are self-guided and free where you can um, learn a little bit more about ethical AI, what you can do in your products. Uh, and when I say product, that's the same as if you're doing a research project. To me, they, they can be very analogous. But yeah, I think that is all of them. Um, definitely happy to take questions and or dive deeper into anything that y'all would like. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna. That was a fantastic presentation. So. <laughs> So maybe I'll kick us off with a question. So um, I think much has been made about explainability and, and transparency tools um, for neural networks. And, I, and I've seen lots of really cool examples of, of it working. Um, I wonder to what extent do you see them being kind of practically used when, you know, like a data scientist is actually creating a model? Uh, do they, are they actually, do they have real utility there uh, and are people using them frequently? That's a great question. Um, I, I think that the way that they could be used the best, and I have seen this in some instances, is looking at failure cases. Uh, but even then, 
the tools aren't as useful as just looking at the images. So basically like trying to figure out, okay, where if I'm doing a cat versus dog, you know, classifier or whatever, and I look at all my failure cases and I find out that all my chihuahuas are being classified as cats because they're small. Uh, um, then I might look to see, okay, well, what's going on with my training data? What's going on with, um, yeah, I had to look at my training data basically in that instance and then be able to say, okay, well, how can I fix this? And for that, I probably wouldn't need, you know, any of these fancy schmancy transparency um, uh, tools because my eyeballs are able to figure it out faster and better than anything that we've built. Um, but in other cases, it might be helpful. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of times what I mentioned earlier of using a different type of model, so a segmentation model versus just a peer classification model is, is more powerful and indicative to like the end user as well as the uh, model designer. So, but yeah, no, that's a good question. Got it, thank you, yeah. Yeah, there's um, a researcher at Google, Bean Kim, and she's been researching this for, researching like explainability in, in deep learning models quite a bit. So she might have a much different take on it uh, than I do, but yeah. Great, um, other questions for Anna? So I actually have another one. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks here, I think, are, are researchers uh, as well. And a lot of times the, the things that we uh, build aren't necessarily going to be um, kind of deployed very widely uh, and, you know, be, be actually interfacing with people. We will work on like toy problems and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm just wondering, like, uh, there's probably a continuum of, you know, how much consideration you maybe need to put into the design. I think there should always be some, but maybe, you know, you should be very much more certain when you're actually deploying uh, a system and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on like the continuum from kind of academic interests all the way up through like deployment and industry and, and how maybe we can think about these things. Yeah, totally. That's a great question. And um, I think there can be research, which even if it's, uh, just in academia can be quite harmful. Uh, and this mostly revolves around the ethical use and not, well, some bias too, but some of the more recent examples is uh, things like gaydar. So basically trying to predict if from a picture, if somebody is gay or not gay, or even just predicting, um, yeah, it's so bad. I saw some cringy faces, which I was glad to see. Um, even predicting like uh, age or race or uh, gender can be really problematic because these are sociological constructs um, versus something that can really have ground truth labels and that, you know, a, a image can really capture on for a lot of different reasons. So like, you know, avoiding research like that is good <laughs> for sure. Um, but then if you get into questions of bias, you know, like there have been instances where, uh, especially around reinforcement learning, you can create images. And if, uh, I think it was, I don't exactly know what, I think it was going from like a pixelated image to like, a uh, more full image or anyways, someone was able to uh, use research where the model was, you know, put on to GitHub, et cetera, and then pass in pictures of Barack Obama as well as other black individuals and lighten the skin. So I think it might've been like a glamor filters or yeah, filters can have problems too. Uh, so, so yeah, there's there's definitely areas where even if it is just research, it can harm a community if you are 
basically playing off of stereotypes historical stereotypes which have been harmful in the past um, or aren't true for the whole population or you're trying to basically pigeonhole individuals into societal norms that they don't believe in um, one of the ones actually that I heard about yesterday I think was an age something that aged people it's like Ooh, what do I look like when I'm in 50 years or something and it was removing people's tattoos, uh, maybe because older individuals didn't have as many tattoos, unclear. But that was also uh, harmful to communities where tattoos were part of their heritage and their culture. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Um, and NLP has all sorts of biases, but um, yeah. Uh, well, word models, they're getting better. I think i think we're starting to solve some of those, but basically like you just grab things off the web and it's reflected in the work that you do. So yeah, think about that. And basically think about the worst tweet that could be made of your paper and be like, okay, yeah. how do I avoid that from that? Yeah, <laughs> I like that as a metric, yeah. 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 I have a, a quick question. So we have a few more minutes. So yeah. today we have kind of an interface in this conversation right now between kind of academia and industry. And I think everybody has definitely a, a part in this, you know, uh, kind of ethical AI direction. But what would you like or what would you think uh, would be great to see from academia as like a great result that maybe in industry it's a little bit harder, you know, to work for this direction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, mm. You know, one of the, I don't know. Oh, one of the biggest issues is how to, a lot of the bias work in particular requires information on subgroup information. So I, I need to know, was this tweet that I'm predicting sentiment on, like what was the age, the gender, the race, the socioeconomic group, et cetera? Uh, uh, of the person so that I can check to see if my sentiment classifier, for instance, is biased against these different groups. But when I'm thinking about privacy and safety, I don't want any of that information because it could be then personally identifiable and I don't really want to store it. And there's things I can do to, to make sure that that data is safe, but, you know, like how, how can I, you know, like, in an aggregate way, uh, check for bias when I may not have the metadata of this information, or I want to occlude that metadata from anybody else in my organization. So if you can solve that problem, that'd be great. But so, so if I understand that correctly, what you think the role of academia here is to develop new kind of algorithms or mathematical uh, frameworks maybe to, to solve a class of problems like the one you described and this is more I, I would agree also that this is more of a kind of an academia thing and then the industry would come and kind of put this into the place in the in the world okay yeah sounds, sounds great yeah no for sure and and there are other algorithms in terms of transparency or in terms of even though admittedly i sort of said oh no transparency methods aren't useful except for model cards but um yeah there's there's a lot a lot that we can do around that area as well as better mitigation strategies so like ai 360 has a couple of like mitigation algorithms in it, uh, which basically reweight training data coming in or things coming out. Uh, but what else can we do? Is that how can we um, optimize the accuracy of, of like the full model while trying to get um, our quality metrics up? Because sometimes there's a trade-off. You're trying to build build up the predictions of a minority group, and that might make the majority group fall a little bit, which makes your your end accuracy number fall a bit, which makes you know my PMs and product owners like freak out a little bit. 
All right, so I think we're, we're right at time. So let's, let's thank Anna again for that wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for being here.